Good evening. Thank you, uh, Bhagirath Bhai and respected chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bansi. Thank you, Astra, for have believing in me and, uh, as a part of disclosure as well. I'm going to touch upon what's new in heart failure. Uh, and I'm so glad that ever since DICON started, I've been talking only on one molecule, and that's on SGLT2s. So uh, uh, it's a pleasure that I believed in, and I used to remember that I used to be the only cardiologist coming to a diabetes conference those days. And everybody would be frowning what this guy is doing here. Now nobody questions that why this SGL22 is being talked about by a cardiologist. So that's a pleasure change. My convictions, my belief in the molecule has been proven and with one more important and a fantastic trial. And I'm going to touch upon that trial which is called as Deliver. So let's look at heart failure. It's a growing public health problem. We all know high mortality. Dr. Chavla also covered it. A huge burden, 64 million people. You require a lot of patients to be hospitalized every year. Your beds are uh, occupied with them. And heart failure hospitalization is a further expected to rise by 50% in the next 25 years. So if you're seeing one or two patients of heart failure in a 10 bed ICU right now, you can anticipate them probably to double. What about mortality? Despite therapies like ARNI, five year mortality continues to be 50% and it's going to rise after each hospitalization despite uh, availability of newer therapies. Despite the poor prognosis, there is lack of urgency of early identification and initiation of guideline directed therapy. Over 40% of heart failures have been diagnosed up to symptoms of five years prior to the diagnosis and 75% of those who are diagnosed with heart failure, they end up requiring an unplanned hospitalization. This is primarily from the US data that the guideline directed therapies are not optimal in majority of the country, a majority of the patients, even in countries like US. 30% mortality is anticipated if you have an admitted patient within a year. So you'll end up losing one patient uh, within a year out of three. The major recommendations, of course, this is not something uh, I need to enlighten you on. You all know that if the patient is reduced ejection fraction, nobody is doubting that it's class one level of what European society guideline calls it level of evidence is level A. And for the others, however, the mid range, it was 2A and heart failure society in preserve talk about 2A, but I'm sure this is going to change soon with the two important trials breaking in. Emperor preserved came a couple of years, uh, one year back, and then you have now deliver coming in this year. Now, somebody was asking, do you believe it's molecule? I strongly believe it's molecule. Why? Otherwise, if you had Empire Preserve, why would you require data from DAPA to be asked from Deliver? And on top of that, you have trials that have been copied in the trial design like Empareg for ertugliflozin in Voltis. Absolutely same inclusion exclusion criteria does not reduce mortality. So I strongly believe that the SGLT2 and SGLT1 ratio is an important predictor and determinant how the class molecules within the class differ and is it true only for SGLT2? No. Do you have data for all sartans for heart failure? No. Do I uh, have they been evaluated? Yes. Do you have same data for all beta blockers? No. So I believe that we have to move from signs of mo of the class effects to signs of molecules and now we are moving a step ahead we are moving to personalized medicine which is a separate chapter now in Harrison in diabetology in cardiology people talk about personalized medicine each patient is different guidelines will tell you but then if you were to ask me primary prevention I will say yes SGLT to all so why do I believe it we can discuss it off late but my topic sticking to what I talk uh, I usually uh, uh, should be sticking to is DAPA HF which we all know uh, and is it's much easier to understand in patients with reduced rejection fraction 4700 patients placebo controlled amine BNPs of 1400 plus ejection fraction of 31 percent and 55 percent without diabetes now this is one trial that tells you yes we have less diabetics more non-diabetics studied in this therapy investigators were driven primarily by cardiologists published in a cardiology forum and of course published uh, in an EGM as well 41 percent without an EGFR with less than six, uh, 60 were, were the CKD patients that Dr. Gang was talking about and how early the differences arise. 
as early as 28 days. The curves start diverging as early as 28 days when they become significant. How many patients you need to treat? Just 21. You put this patient, 21 patients on this therapy and you end up preventing one event of composite of death or worsening of heart failure. And remember, worsening is hospitalization. You just treat 21 patients of your heart failure with dapagliflozin. You have prevented either a death within one month or prevented one patient getting admitted to ICU. Tell me any one therapy in diabetology forget even diabetology in cardiology except acute coronary syndrome when you do an angioplasty no therapy even in cardiology has shown these kind of data even if you look at trials like rails which talked about so much of spironolactone in class 3 4 much sicker patients 16 percent reduction still they did not achieve it within 28 days so 20 cv death of worsening of heart failure relative risk reduction was 26 percent absolute reductions like this five percent you know nearly five percent which other trial in a normal inclusion would end up even absolute reduction of five percent with four zeros after a dot and then comes one of a p-value you you talk about uh, uh arnie trials in paragon hf and you debate was 0.06 q ho gaya. you know thoda sa dhakka lagta, significant ho jata. you know that that's the debate on Paragon HF in preserved ejection fraction of RV. But what about SGLT2? Hands down, you as many as zeros as you can take for the test of significance. But all cause mortality, this is my favorite. What matters? No patient is going to come and tell you that my urine is so much in the I mean, it's, it's important. But if you tell you I'm going to save your life, I mean, does anything else matter? If you are going to prevent death, there is no strong predictor or determinant of choosing a therapy. If you give a drug and death is prevented, there cannot be a debate of not choosing that therapy. 17% reduction reaching statistical significance. Now, let me come to deliver. So, this is well established reduced ejection fraction. What about preserved ejection fraction? How rampant it is? Dr. Bansi and I were discussing. We had started doing BNPs in our diabetic and I had started doing in hypertensive patient, outpatient basis anti-pro BNP. And we were shocked. We used to think these labs are wrong. Most of our patients, Dr. Bansi says most of his patients had BNP elevated and they all were practically asymptomatic. These probably are the patients who probably had some element of preserved ejection fraction with occult heart failure. These were the patients who were not manifesting because either they were too obese, not doing activities enough, limiting their lifestyle changes. And if they were to be subjected to activities which were we consider as class one, probably they will, uh, class two, they would end up becoming significant. So the deliver was then evaluated. What about ejection fraction more than 40% with elevated BNP, ambulatory or hospitalized with EGFR more than 25. Remember DAPA in DAPA HF had EGFR of 30. Now you have data up to 25. You, of course, EMPA had data of 20. Randomized one is to one. Baseline 1000 of NT pro BNP. 54% was the average EF. 55% still majority were non diabetic. 10% of these were recently hospitalized or discharged. And 18% were patients with prior ejection fraction less than 40%. So this also tells you answer. What about those patients whose EF has improved? You've started ARNI, you've started DAPA, and they have now EF is 55. Do you still consider them? Yes, you still consider 18% were representative in this sample. Of course, completely completely matched uh, but very importantly I talk about this Empire uh, uh, the Emperor Preserve did not have 20% kind of a representation of Asian population which is still there so this is geographic distribution one out of five patients were from our uh, 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 part of the world and remember 75 three fourths of the patients were class 2 when you look at the BNP on atrial fibrillation or without atrial fibrillation, they were of course different cutoffs and prior heart failure hospitalized patients had EF of 40% mean and more nearly half of the patient had EGFR below 60. Three fourths of the patients were on loop diuretics, one third or one, one third were on ACE, one third on ARBs and even 5% were on ARNI if you are a very strong believer of ARNI uh, as a therapy in, from Paragon as a, a treatment for reduced ejection or preserved ejection fraction or mid-range ejection fraction and we heard a wonderful talk from Dr. Gang talking about MRA as a therapy and one half of them were on this therapy as well. Now when you compare what happened in the delivered trial in patients there was reduced risk of death or worsening heart failure. Remember this is one 
one trial, when you compare Empire Preserved versus Empire, um, uh, Empire trial versus other trials, the inclusion exclusions were very different and changing to confuse you all the more Empire Preserved, Empire Reduced. Here, the primary endpoint in Dapagli flows in across Deliver or DAPA HF has remained same. Composite of death or worsening of heart failure to make it simple. No conclusion, no cutoffs of itna EGFR. I mean, uh, at this NT Pro BNP, you end up with this EF, which is a problem with MPA, uh, with the Emperor Preserved. You had, if you had X amount of EF, your this is your inclusion criteria for that amount of NT Pro BNP. No confusion was there with regards to that uh, uh, in patients uh, with the uh, delivered trial. So, Full population and the EF with less than 60, if you, there were dual analysis was done, if you include all patients, Dapagli flows in showed P of 0 0.008 with 18% reduction with hazards of 0.82 across the study population. But what about patients whose EF was not uh, so high? If you only include patients with EF less than 60, which included patients with EF more than 40 to have improved up to 60, it was even better with 17%, uh, almost nearly the same, 17% reduction uh, in that subgroup. So the worsening heart failure, which included the combination of heart failure hospitalization versus urgent heart failure visit, also was significantly reduced with a hazards ratio of 0.79 of 21% reduction. And again, you can see the curve start diverging very early within a couple of days and the curves have been like wonderfully separated out uh, as early as three months. Uh, with regards to the death alone as an endpoint, it was not statistically significant, though it was there was a trend and the trend, the curves have started diverging. Maybe you end up looking at seven or ten years down the line, like our I always tell my surgical friends, the stitch trial. Five years, no difference. Ten years, there is a difference in surgical reduction. Uh, so, uh, you don't know. But as of now, at the end point of this trial, there was no difference in mortality as a low end point. Outcomes, when you compare EF less than 60 versus more than 60, e across the class, there is a difference in significance of improvement. But there is small amount of difference in terms of CV death. In patients whose ejection fraction was more than 60%, it favored mortality reduction. Now, this is something that has not been observed with ampagliflozin. This is really interesting. You get more heart failure reduction. You need to go through the subgroup analysis. Why this has happened? What were the sub kind of subgroup of patients? Maybe they were more amyloidosis, maybe more sarcoidosis, maybe more infiltrative disorder. Maybe these were more sicker patients with higher BNP. But these were the patients who actually did better uh, in terms of mortality benefit. The primary endpoint, if you look at the ejection fraction class, again, the EF, the more it was, the benefits were tending to be more for the uh, hazards improvement for the primary endpoint. And for the within 30 days of heart failure, again, the sicker patients, more quickly you pick up, are going to benefit even more. What about improved ejection fraction? Of course, they did better. Means if you had a patient whose EF was now 42 and has now become 50 and now you've enrolled him he is going to do better naturally because he still has some amount of uh, risk of getting into reduced ejection fraction again looking at in terms of the ethnicity asians uh, did not do any differently much for the europeans or saudi arabia and latin americans again the hazards are slightly different but not very much different all individual components were attributed to superiority to the primary composite endpoint all of them contributed death also contributed to the primary composite endpoint uh, reaching its significance but it individually did not reach a significance the worsening of heart failure did reach individual significance though study was not designed to look death as a primary composite endpoint reduction. It was for the primary endpoint of a composite endpoint of hospitalization with death. So total heart failure events with and cardiovascular death, which was secondary endpoint, the uh, cumulative incidence for heart failure events with CV death when it was compared, the hazards ratio was down uh, at three years. And then again, the curves were starting to separate out much earlier and the number of events were much lower right from the first event to composite events. The number of events when you add up, all of them were tending to be significantly reduced. So was the quality life mean change in KCCQ total score was significantly improved with the win ratio defined as 11% improvement and if it was worse uh, when you compare with placebo it was worse right for more than 5 versus plus 15 improvement again so all across the class how many significant which characteristic uh, cumulatively each of them individual parameters some of the parameters all of them were significantly different safety tolerability when you look at Fourier's gangrene there's none in DAPA HF and none in deliver. D DKA 
was there in DAPA HF in 3, which is 0.1%, and again it remains the same. Otherwise, no significant signal with volume depletion being similar in patients in uh, DAPA versus placebo. So, to conclude, this is the largest, most inclusive trial of heart failure. You don't have to look at NT pro BNP to include for uh, different cutoffs of ejection fraction. Of course, you diagnose diastolic heart failure based on your NT pro BNP and a good echocardiography, but in a patient with reduced or projection, Reserved ejection fraction, DAPA gliflows and reduced the risk of primary composite of death or heart worsening of heart failure. It reduced all components, including total heart failure events, and resulted in improvement in symptom burden with the KCCQ total sum score. And these are consistent across the subgroups defined with EF with no attenuation even in the highest subgroup of ejection fraction which is more than 65 percent and this is actually the trial you need to analyze why the sickest of the patients uh, not only do well that is understandable but why the patients with ejection fraction more than 65 actually had a trend in reduction in mortality dapagliflozin was effective in recent hospitalization with prior hospital reduced ejection fraction whose ef had now improved to more than 40 percent even those patients were doing well so serious adverse events leading to discontinuation was similar between the two groups and these data hence provide evidence to support SGLT2 as one of the four pillars as we call regardless of the ejection fraction. So heart failure put on a DAPA gliflozin. That's to conclude. So we have the exclusion to 11,000 patients, DAPA HF less than 40, deliver more than 40% and it has shown consistent different benefit with hazards all across the spectrum of EF, DAPA being better with 14% relative risk reduction and pre-specified level reaching in the pooled analysis also with 14% relative risk reduction on death for DAPA HF versus 26% reduction of heart failure hospitalization. So initiate DAPA to transform patients ejection fraction, we have significant benefits of benefit across the range of EF and significant 14% reduction in CV death and it's the only SGLT2 which has mortality benefit with heart failure and it's a key component of guideline directed therapy with ejection fraction uh, with reduced ejection fraction or preserved. Thank you very much.